Operation White Tower. Objective, Mount McKinley. Mission, scientific research on the highest peak in North America. Just as the analytical study of high altitudes must start at sea level, so many a high adventure has a prosaic beginning. Expedition leader Bradford Washburn and Mrs. Washburn embark on a standard commercial airliner out of Minneapolis, bound more than 1,800 miles north on the first leg of a journey that will end where few men and no women have ever been before, the roof of the world. Months of planning and plane loads of equipment have already preceded them over the granite vertebrae of the Canadian Rockies toward Anchorage, Alaska, where they will join the other members of their party. Conducted by the Boston Museum of Science, of which Washburn is the director, the expedition has over 11,000 pounds of climbing and camping equipment, food and scientific instruments. These have to be sorted and packed into smaller transport units, some to be dropped later by periodic parachute delivery, and the rest to go with them by air when they establish their base. Speed is becoming imperative. A warm coastal spring is already slushing up and rotting the hard snow surface of Hood Lake. Soon the little cabin plane will be unable to take off on the ski runners, which it will need for landing in the interior, where it is still winter. The advance party, assigned to setting up the nucleus of the base camp, is finally airborne, however, and the expedition is officially underway. One hundred and fifty air miles north of Anchorage, surrounded by foothills, which are imposing mountains in their own right, looms Mount McKinley. Denali, the Indians called it, the home of the sun. Three miles high, its arrogant heights have been scaled but four times in the entire history of man. Drooling at the rate of only a few inches a day down the east face of the mountain is Muldrow Glacier. This turgid river of ice presents the only climbable route to the summit of Mount McKinley. Here at its terminus is a natural landing strip, dry snow blanketing glacial ice a thousand feet thick. Here in the heart of what is now Mount McKinley National Park, was for centuries terra incognita, unknown land, left blank white on the map of Alaska. The advance party unloads airborne freight, where until a mere 50 years ago, no white man had ever set foot. Then the Alaska gold rush blazed the famous trail of 98 across the loud white silence of the interior, revealing that Denali was not just an Indian legend, but a wondrous mountain that still challenges men like these to climb it, if they can. A double-walled, weatherproof tent goes up first on the campsite. For by plane, from the warm spring of Anchorage, it's a sudden change to the nights that will be 30 below zero here on the glacier. It will take 13 flights and three weeks' work to complete the camp and assemble the expedition's assorted personnel. From the Boston Museum, the leader, the young and famous mountain explorer Bradford Washburn. And Mrs. Washburn, herself an expert mountaineer. H.T. Victorine of the University of Chicago's Physics Department. James Gale, representing the Air Force's 10th Rescue Squadron. Grant Pearson, Chief Ranger of McKinley National Park. Lieutenant William Hackett, representing the Army Ground Forces. William Sterling of INS and RKO Radio Pictures. Robert Lang of the University of New Hampshire. Robert Craig of the American Alpine Club. George Brown, the official artist, here to record the expedition on canvas. And to document it on film are RKO Path A cameramen William Deke and George Wellston. Here also to test the effect of low temperature and high altitude on motion picture equipment. Taking frozen food to Alaska seems like carrying coals to Newcastle, but in an area that is one vast deep freeze, this will be the first expedition to be constantly supplied with fresh food. With the arrival of a team of nine dogs, the roster is finally complete. Norris, the dog driver, has taken his team 110 miles overland from park headquarters in only four days. 
While waiting for climbing weather, the approaches to McKinley are studied for the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey. And for the U.S. Weather Bureau, complete temperature records are compiled from the recording thermometer. Wash day waits for the first indication of spring, when it's just above freezing at noon. But that's about as tropical as it ever gets, and the long-handled lingerie will continue to be basic regulation wear. Word is radio relayed back to civilization that the expedition is ready to make the climb and will need more of its supplies. At Elmansdorf Field, the 10th Rescue Squadron of the Alaskan Air Command loads the first of a series of flights that will keep them supplied by airdrop all the way up the mountain. The first exploration project to receive constant air support, most of the freight is unbreakable and can be safely dropped free fall, landing on the doorstep like the morning paper. Brittle food and delicate instruments are parachute packed and dropped from a higher altitude to assure a well-cushioned landing. To facilitate easier handling on the ground, the air drop freight is packed into two or three units. The chutes are salvaged to be deadheaded back to Anchorage and used again. It's the end of April at base camp. Time to take a walk in the snow. Now, if ever, is the chance to climb McKinley, to go up with the thermometer, follow the subarctic spring day by day up the mountain. These people are seeking the summit of McKinley, not the notoriety of the Sunday supplements. They are technicians, scientists, dedicated by instinct to rip the icy curtain away from one of the last mysteries left on the map. The gentle slope and easy footing of the lower glacier is deceptive, but there's 15 miles to the top as a de-iced and pressurized crow would fly. the expedition is broken into separate parties who must follow and rejoin each other's trail, often in a cottony fog, the back trail is marked at intervals with black wooden wands. Working out of the base camp with 500 pound sled loads, the dogs will follow the easy trail upward toward the first camp. A glacier is really a river whose eddies and currents have been glazed into micrometric slow motion. At 7,000 feet, where a free-flowing river would run to rapids, the glacial stream offers a tedious passage of crevasses, huge transverse cracks in the ice, which must somehow be detoured. With no slack in the lifeline, the drifted cover of wind-formed bridges must be cautiously probed to determine whether they offer solid footing or an 80-foot drop through the treacherous snow into the bowels of the black ice. With the glacier badly crevassed, constant time-wasting detours are necessary to find safe crossing, often as much as 500 yards to gain a few feet of forward progress.
cross cut with danger, and the dogs, their sled lashed with 500 pounds of dead weight, must be driven skillfully in order to get through safely to camp number two. Night on Mount McKinley draws back begrudgingly from the magnesium flares of the impudent, short-winded earthlings. To reward them, perhaps, for having climbed so high, the gods of the mountain reveal their secrets. Deep fretted galleries of frozen amethyst, a fairyland of crystal canyons and emerald caverns, frosted to the bottom of the northern lights since the first age of ice. At 1,000 feet, the glacier ends against an impassable Niagara of ice. To continue, the party must portage up nearby Costin's Ridge, a natural causeway running like the edge of a knife 4,000 feet further up the Big Heat. The easy approach to the ridge has been made, and now it's time to go into second gear. Snowshoes are jettisoned for crampons ice creepers that will bite into the snow which is packed flint smooth by the constant gales which sweep the comb of Karsten's Ridge. The mountain axe too with its spike point for ice and its mattock blade for snow is vital equipment from here on up. Keeping to the crest to avoid the danger of avalanches, the expedition laboriously chops its way topside. Backpacking their supplies, 6,000 steps have to be cut and kicked out of the mountain, for there are no escalators on the White Tower. faith can move mountains, but it takes tenacity to climb them. Up here where the air is thin, every breath is a lung full of icicles and steel wool, and the languid fever of lethargy requires a separate decision to follow each step with another. On no other mountains must the climber live so long on snow and ice as in Alaska. This mountain, McKinley, highest in Alaska, highest in North America, rises higher above its tableland and demands more sustained climbing than any other mountain in the world. But 18,000 feet up in Denali Pass, there's work to be done. Parachuted here by the Air Force, sensitive precision instruments must be unpacked and assembled to research some of the mysteries of the elemental atom. For here, nuclear physicist Victorine of Chicago University can observe the cosmic rays perform as though directed by a cyclotron. High altitude observation of cosmic rays has previously been logged only in hours. This station will remain operating for 11 days to set a new record in science. While the expedition's primary objective is cosmic ray research, the collection of geologic specimens is another. At Denali Pass are handy outcroppings of the unique yellowish granite that forms the upthrust core of the huge McKinley mass. No 
one attains this summit easily. When an angry flag of snow spume whips defiantly from her towering top gallant, old Denali can be a regular man of war of mountains. A sudden gale whiplashing out of the southwest, meeting all men broadside in the black teeth of a 90 mile wind, trying to hurdle them broken back down to the sea level where they belong. thousand feet above sea level and 40 degrees below zero. Climbing is slow, tortured. The wind is an icy bayonet, deep frosting a man to the marrow with its perishing, penetrating cold. Other men have turned back when only a few hundred feet from the peak. But after 75 days, this expedition is determined to be the fourth ever to attain the summit of McKinley. tip of the White Tower, three miles above sea level, between the 63rd parallel and the Arctic Circle. This is the capstone of a continent, as high as you can go and still say, this is America. Mm -hmm. 